Hello everyone and welcome to Exploring Media Theory uh, Lecture 7. This week we're going to be looking at various forms of feminist analysis. Um, this is the first of two lectures on feminism. And of course this is the pre-recorded lecture. So the aims of this lecture are to explore two main feminist approaches to the media. Um, I'm going to be talking about liberal feminism and what I've termed here cultural studies feminism. Now both of these terms are a little bit ambiguous and although they're both quite recognised in the literature, um, liberal feminists or cultural studies feminists possibly wouldn't badge themselves in that way but it's just providing a framework upon which we can look at some of the differences between these two schools of thought. Um, so what I want to do is look at these two main theories, apply these two uh, theories to various examples and look at some of the evidence for it and also to offer some critical, eva critical evaluation of each theory. Um, we're going to be using some of the concepts we've been exploring across the course such as discourse, structure and action and the idea of essentialism. Um, next week we're going to look at two further forms of feminist analysis where again we'll be comparing it, comparing each using these kind of terms. So. <coughs> have to excuse me this week, I've got a bit of a cold. Um, there are various forms of feminism. It is a very large um, critical discourse, um, a bit like Marxism in some ways, in that we can broadly distinguish between what we might term activist feminism and the more academic school of feminism. The academic school of feminism uh, looks at various approaches that you can adopt with feminist analysis to the media and other forms of text. Activists use some of those forms of analysis and try to advance things. Of course, academics also try to advance gender equality, but they tend to be more analytic on the one hand if on the academic side and more activist based upon the other. Um, there's various forms of feminism out there. We're just going to look at four main forms on this course. There are innumerable different overlaps between the different schools, but they're all broadly um, underpinned by the same goal, which is to achieve some form of equality between sexes and the genders in contemporary life. Um, so this week we're going to be looking at liberal feminism and cultural studies feminism. There is also a school of uh, thought called socialist or Marxist feminism, which unfortunately we're not really going to have time to look at on this course. But very briefly speaking, socialist or Marxist feminism argues that feminism can best be achieved by achieving the aims of a socialist or Marxist. That is, gender equality will be achieved once we achieve class equality. And so for a socialist or Marxist feminist, the first fight you really need to address is getting equality between the classes. Once you've achieved that, other battles will be far easier to achieve. Next week we're going to be looking at radical feminism, which is another form of feminism, but it may be called sort of the more dynamic edge of feminism, um, and it has slightly different beliefs to other forms that we're going to study. We'll also be looking at post-structuralist and post-modern forms of feminism. And I don't want to go too deeply into there, but they draw upon a lot of the advances uh, within post-structural theory. Um, and we've also broached on some of the ideas of postmodernism on this course and they take, take forward and advance some of those points in relation to achieving the ideas of feminism. Um, all of these camps feed into debates over the idea of what might be termed post-feminism, which is the idea that we've moved beyond a need for feminism. And that's something we're going to explore next week. Um, I'll say at this point, it's not a position I hold very strongly with myself to post feminist things. One final point before I move on is I often get asked by students, can men be feminists? And I would say unequivocally yes, men can be feminists. I would count myself as a feminist um, and I would try to see some of my work as moving towards more gender, equa gender equality. Um, so yes, men can be feminists, and many many men do consider themselves feminists and actively work towards achieving better gender uh, representation and gender equality. So let's move on a bit. Um, each of these various theories that we've talked about makes key assumptions. And as you've seen across the course, we've got these different perspectives upon the media. Um, and this week we're looking at feminism. But within 
this broad church of feminism, this broad school approach, there are different varieties. And each of these different varieties has some difference in the, how they consider the fundamentals of the argument. So some of the kind of things that we're going to be exploring about whether there are essential differences between the genders. Now here it's also worth noting the difference between sex and gender. Sex is the biological attributed thing that you achieve at birth, whether you've got male organs or female organs. Gender is the social construction and it's our social identities. So are there essential differences between the genders, um, between how people who present as men are different from people who, who present as women? That's one thing we're going to look at. That. We're also going to look at the relative power of social structures versus human agency. So do we have freedom in this regard? Uh, do we, can we articulate um, our own thoughts and things? Or are we really pretty much receptacles for social ideas about gender? So to what degree do we reconstruct these gender ideas in our, in our own mind? Or are we just vehicles for social ideas of gender? What, what's our freedom? And what's our constraints? We're going to look at the idea of, of nature and language and how those impact upon how we think about gender. And these have a lot of ramifications to the ideas that maybe the language structures how we see the world and maybe language structures how we interpret the world. We're also going to be looking at the role of media and popular culture in how um, gender, gender ideals are perpetuated and propagated down, down the generations. And we're going to be looking at some of the causes of inequality and what we can actually do to address some of these things. And here we're moving across a little bit into the more activist version of feminism. Rather than just looking at it as an analytical project, we're looking at, of course, of how we can improve things. Now, feminism and Marxism are, are similar in this way, in that many Marxist academics also have an activist element to them. Many feminist academics, they don't just do it as a dry intellectual activity, they seek to advance women's interests. And so the academic school of thought is often integrated into the activist, but even though they are not separate, they are linked together, they are different forms of action. <coughs> so we're going to be looking at some of the things that can actually be done to advance equality there. Okay, well one thing is, do we still need feminism? And this is an argument that gets raised up, particularly by the right-wing press, every few years. The argument is, well, women have the vote. Women have had the vote for 90 years, 100 years or so. Uh, women do not get paid less for jobs. If, the, if a woman applies for a job, it doesn't say you're going to get paid less for that thing. Um, so why do we need feminism anymore? Surely we've moved beyond that point. You have a female prime minister in Theresa May at the moment. We've got female head of state with Queen Elizabeth. You've even got a female head of the judiciary, which is the third arm of government. So all three main roles in the management of a modern political state are filled by women. Surely we have achieved equality now. However, if you open any newspaper in the past couple of months, you will find enormous um, revelations going on about uh, women being abused in all forms of economic, political and social life. Uh, two weeks ago, Michael Fallon um, resigned as um, Defence Secretary uh, for various misdemeanors he'd done in the past and laughed them off and said things had changed since when he'd done them and now we're far more strict. But sexual abuse is sexual abuse. It doesn't change over time. It doesn't get more acceptable. Uh, it's just that now it's come to time. On average, two women are killed each week by a violent partner or ex-partner. Uh, a recent study done by the BBC revealed that 50% of women have been on the receiving end of some form of sexual harassment. Uh, the gender gap has narrowed in the last 10 years in the EU, but it's still more than 10% in most countries, and it's 18% in the UK. And women continue to suffer systematic disadvantage in law, politics and mainstream media. They are not promoted. The leaders of these sectors tend not to be women. Add to all that, we've got President Trump. Uh, and although he's not president of any European country, um, the manner in which he speaks of women is kind of like a keystone. If you imagine a bridge and you've got this kind of edifice in the middle that supports a lot of the neo-right and the new rights misogyny going on. And if you don't remember, Trump was recorded saying you can grab women by the pussy. You can do anything. 
and we've got a little thing there. Trump brags on tape about using fame to get women, uh, to use his fame and his power to force women or pressure women into having sex with him. So perhaps we do still need feminism in contemporary times. Okay, so I'm going to turn to you a little bit about some kind of historicise it a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me, just a little sip of coffee here. Okay, I want to talk about first about liberal feminism. Uh, liberal feminism is a branch of feminism. It has its roots in early feminist movements dating from the late 1890s through to about the 1920s. Of course, there were feminist theories before that. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft uh, famously wrote Vindication of the Rights of Women, I think at the turn of the 19th century. And that was a response to a text by Thomas Paine called Vindication of the Rights of Man, which is about when the modern political state was being established across many countries in Europe and in the United States, the idea that individual people have rights as opposed to be just being subject to the will of a ruler. So Thomas Paine wrote this book called Vindication of the Rights of Man, um, sorry, The Rights of Man. It was a famous text and it set out what men and immense humanity are allowed to do. Allowed to do. Um, a, clo a colleague of his, or a friend of his, Mary Wollstonecraft, who was uh, Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein's mother, wrote Vindication of the Rights of Women, where she set out particular aspects of what women needed as well. Now a lot of these ideas were carried forward and by the turn of the 19th into the 20th centuries uh, there was a build of gradual momentum. At this point women didn't have the vote in the UK and they sought what's termed suffrage which is the ability to have a vote, your, your right to have a vote. Um, there was universal suffrage was gradually established throughout the 19th century where the working classes are given it but still by the 10th and 20th century, women still didn't have a vote. So the suffragettes were women who were campaigning for uh, the rights of women to have votes. And they campaigned in the 19th century and early 20th century. Finally, this was won in 1918. Um, unfortunately, it was restricted to women over the age of 30 who were householders, who were married to a man who owned a house or owned a house themselves. They were not granted full equality with men until 1928. So it's still 91 years. Uh, women have only had the vote, was it 89 years? No, it's, it's still now 90 years um, that women have only had the vote in the UK. A second wave of feminism occurred in 1950s onwards. Um, this kind of reflected also the increased standing of women when women were taken on to take men of the roles that men took on during the war and when men returned from the war uh, this world war ii uh, women were pushed out of the domestic back into the domestic sphere and this is felt to be problematic by many people and it was also reacting against the constraints of the female role model in the 1950s and the economic marginalization when we were pushed to the boundaries of the economy, taking on particular roles within the economy, whereas during the war they've been taking on far more roles. So there's a bit of a, a not so much a backlash, but it was a, a realization that women should be playing a great part in the economy and in civic and social life. Now, uh, one of the first texts written in the, I think it's late 1950s, early 1960s, was Betty Friedman. Um, and she was talking about women were subject to what she termed the feminine, feminine mystique. Um, and what she was talking about is a, is a kind of perception of femininity. We might even call it an ideology of femininity that permeated Western society. And this ideology basically basically propose that women can only be happy if they are a mother and a housewife. And other forms of life for women were less valid. Women shouldn't go out to work because true happiness for a woman came through being a good homemaker, being a good wife to her husband, looking after the children, making sure the domestic sphere was uh, well managed. And what Betty Freeman did was she interviewed numerous women, many of her friends, and lots of women in the 1950s, and she found that, well, even though women did have these things, they did have a happy life, they did, uh, sorry, they did have the happy home, they looked after their husbands, they weren't fulfilled or satisfied. It wasn't enough. Um, so she 
drew this text called Feminine Mystique um, and it was quite a, an important text and she looked at how during the 1950s this belief had spread and it spread through socialization and particularly through the media and advertising. Now interestingly she also found out that this, this idea wasn't anywhere near as prevalent in the 1930s so it was kind of presented as being a traditional position for women. But when she looked back at history, she found it wasn't so traditional. It was a, a contemporary articulation of various forms of power to keep women in a position. It was the way in which women were kept in position in the 1950s. Other key accounts, were there was Sue Sharps, Just Like a Girl, and it was about how young girls learn to be women, how they learn to adopt the correct codes and behaviours for being a woman and how our priorities and ambitions are limited through schooling and the media and how girls toys are shaped in a particular way how girls are taught to behave in a particular way and that's quite different from how boys were brought up and then you get Gay Tushman's Hearth and Home images of women in the media and what Gay Tushman was looking at was how were media represented in the media what role, roles were women doing in the media um, and she looked and she wasn't finding women in positions of power or authority. Women were limited to the entertainment function, to the beautification function. Um, so what she was arguing was women were symbolically annihilated from positions of a power. So what they were doing, they were removed out. You did not find women in positions of power. There was no representation of women in these roles. So here's a quote from Gay Tushman. Girls exposed to television women may hope to be homemakers when they are adults, but not workers outside the home. Indeed, as adults, these girls may resist work outside the home until necessary for the well-being of their families. This can represent a problem in the future. The active participation of women in the workforce is vital to the maintenance of the American economy. So what she's arguing there is that equality is actually good for the economy. So she's, this is why it's turned to very much a liberal um, perspective, because she's seen the economic uh, advantages of granting women economy, uh, women this. So she's seeking to get validity for femininity, so for feminism, from an economic rationality, as well as from a gender equality position. To give you a bit of a summary of what we term liberal feminism, liberal feminism seeks, seeks socialisation, particularly sexist and stereotype media content, as the primary explanation for persistent inequalities. The strong social constructionism here, if you remember about social construction, it's the idea that uh, our identities are basically societally produced. Our identities are not emerging from some inner drives or something like that. Rather, we are socially constructed, we draw down ideas from society. So gender roles are constructed. Um, they don't have to be this way. And because of that, reform is possible. It is possible to take our current system and modify it, to improve it, to make there a better representation of women within various forms of socialization, such as the media, and education and things like that. So we can improve the position of women without making enormous changes to our society. And we can modify media content and that will assist women achieve uh, equality. Now this either requires more enlightened men or more progressive equal opportunities in recruitment into key media industries. So for example, Tushman notes the women's movement forced various concessions in news coverage. We now have female anchors in news coverage, female war respondents in news coverage. Um, <coughs> now liberal feminism continues to be an important influence, particularly in the US and amongst business communities in the UK. So for example, the BBC and numerous other FTSE 100 companies, those are companies at the top of the stock exchange, very valuable large companies, uh, expend considerable effort to ensure that the management of their organisation uh, is equal. And for example, the university at the University of Winchester, uh, our Vice-Chancellor is a woman, our Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor is a woman, two of the four deans of faculty are women, 
the head of department in this School of Media and Film is a woman. So there's a lot of effort put into ensuring that women hold positions of power. However, this, this liberal approach to feminism also has its critics. So it doesn't really look uh, to structural inequalities that may be the cause of persistent inequalities and violence. Um, maybe all the problems that women are facing today they're not the causes of inequality, but they are the symptoms of greater structural issues that exist in our society. And all we're doing, we're looking, we're seeing, you know, the, th the symptoms of a much more malignant, more problematic uh, system of power relationships going on in our society. So is it class and power that causes problems? Or, and are these problems just another way in which power is concentrated in the hands of a few? Or are the problems caused by, as some would argue, essential male characteristics? Maybe the problem is just men. Maybe it's something about men that cannot be uh, ameliorated by changing the representation of women. Maybe there's something far deeper than that. It's an issue we're going to explore next week. Uh, is media coverage a cause or consequence of the gender inequality? Is it simply there? Is it? Is it the cause of the problem, or is it just a result of a problem being somewhere else? And then you get the idea the analysis of media content needs to be more nuanced. We need a more, a more sophisticated way of looking at uh, the media. We need to look beyond sheer representation, but to look at the actual language itself. Is there something deeper in the way in which we construct women, not just in pictures, but in the way in which we use words, the way in which our language operates? Finally, do all audiences receive the message in the same way? So this is an argument put by Van Zunen. Um, do men and women receive the audience, receive the messages in the same way? I want to turn now to a second theory, which is called feminist, which I'm badging here, feminist cultural studies. And this is a, a feminist theory utilising a, a cultural studies approach. And if you remember, cultural studies really comes from the ideas of Antonio Gramsci, who was a Marxist, and he talked about the idea, idea of hegemony. It also draws upon uh, the idea of other Marxist theorists, such as Stuart Hall, and the people who worked in the Birmingham Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies. So here we're taking a slightly different approach. This again is one of those schools of thought that is both uh, academic in its origin and its articulation and its of thought, but also it inspires a lot of activism as well. Um, and here there is a focus, oh, it, it also incorporates much of the developments of second wave feminism. And here there's a focus upon the idea of ideology. Um, so they're looking at gender not just in terms of the symptoms and not just in terms of the ideas of representation, but looking at the underlying power structures that occur there. And this is in quite contrast to liberal feminism. It also turns to the idea of subjectivity and how our sense of ourselves may be actually gender. When you think of ourselves, do we think of ourselves as a gender? Um, and if you think of that kind of strange hierarchy of how you work out what you are, are you British, are you American or something like that, you've got a national identity, but you've also got a gendered identity. So they're very interested in how we come to ourselves, sense ourselves as a male or sort of as a man or woman. So they were looking to apply Gramsci's concept of hegemony which is adapted to a feminist agenda within feminist cultural studies. Um, so a couple of the main theorists here was uh, Mac Robbie, 1977, and Winship in 1987. And they, they identified codes of femininity. Um, these, are, these are lines of argument that ran through the ideas of fashion, and beauty, the idea of romance, the idea of competitive individualism, and various strategies for keeping your man. Um, and they looked at these codes in various forms of texts and looked at how they interpolate us. And there they're drawing upon the idea, drawing from earlier Marxist theories, particularly from Althusser, that how we are brought to being through uh, the codes, through the conventions of our society. The codes and conventions of our society give us the devices by which we can think about ourselves. They provide the language, the words, the descriptive terms we can argue about ourselves. Um, and what they were doing, they, they were critiquing 
uh, in these works, the idea of aspirational or individualistic feminism as a form of consumption. Um, and they challenged the idea that this is a, quite a prevalent idea in the 80s and 90s, that through various consumer choices, through various acts of dressing and acts of behaviour, we could uh, people could do feminism, they could be feminist. Women can choose to be empowered or not. They could choose to dress in a particular way and assert their sexuality and assert their um, ways of doing things. Um, and therefore, if women didn't choose to consume various products and act in a feminist way, um, being subjugated was somehow their fault because they have the option there. So what feminist culture studies was critiquing this whole version of feminism that was emerging. And feminist cultural studies were using more critical theories to dig under the surface of these kind of advertising-led ways of thinking about femininity and critique them and challenge them. And feminist cultural studies argues there are structural issues and that our ideology places women in a certain way. And it's very hard to resist the dominant hegemonic system. So what well, we argued that working class boys may engage in hegemonic resistance in the public space via symbolic appropriation. So what she was referring to here is that for many working class <coughs> boys and men, um, when you get to your teenage years, you seek to differentiate yourself from your parents' generation. You rebel, you challenge them. And one of the main ways in which young men typically do this is to look at how their parents wish them to be and to find an opposite to that and dress in that way. Um, and one of the main ways you can do this is by appropriating um, the clothing and the dress and the manner of an outsider group within your society. So you quite often find uh, young white males in the US and in the UK dressing as black uh, hip-hop stars and people from other ethnic minorities and listening to the music and consuming the culture of these other groups and they're doing it kind of maybe subconsciously as a form of resistance to their parents culture and their home culture and their work culture so you want to show how different you are to whatever your parents and your work colleagues or your school is asking you to be. So you dress radically different. The way you do that is you find a group that's somehow been pushed out and you dress like them. And this is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on for quite a long period within modernity. And you can look at youth subcultures and how they dress as a form of resistance to the dominant power system. So what they're doing, they're dressing up in these costumes. It might be dressing it for young white males. It might be dressing as a as a young black male, or it might be just involved dressing as a goth, or finding some other subculture that your parents don't like, that your school doesn't like, and you dress at them deliberately to resist them. Now, what they're arguing is that this is more problematic for young women from a working class background, because not only are teenage girls subject to the same class differentials as young men, but they're subject to gender differentials as well. And to resist gender power is also tricky. And one of the reasons it's actually more tricky is because these gender relationships follow you not just in your workplace and at school, but also at home. They follow you into the bedroom. It's about your personal life. So capitalism sought to win their consent and control their leisure time via the ideological code of femininity in the private space of the bedroom. Now here's a nice copy of Jackie from 1976. However, if you looked at this and you went and picked up a magazine intended for young women today, you will see the same codes, you will see the same ideas permeating. So on here we've got Jackie, the first of summer fun. Join the great Jackie boy hunt. Uh, where have all the boys gone? Find out inside. <clears throat> so Jackie's articulating this position of what is the young women should be doing. Well, they should be interested in, in uh, heterosexual romantic love. That's what young women are about. And these codes follow them not just at work, and not just through how they should dress and everything like that, but right down into their private personal spaces. So feminine, what McRobbie is arguing there is that not only is they subject to the same pressures that young boys are subject to, 
uh, with young boys can articulate this by addressing slightly differently but even when it gets down to their personal codes the personal behavior the things that are attributable to them gender constraints follow them right down closely okay but robbie and winship both studied under stuart hall who was a Marxist working at the Centre for Contemporary Culture Studies in Birmingham, and used his encoding-decoding model, which is in your reading back from previous weeks. Both discuss the political economy of magazines. Um, they're looking at how power relationships result in certain representations uh, being dominant there. But they also re recognise the possibilities for different audience readings, different forms of decoding. And these forms of decoding depend upon class, gender, age, social location, and all sorts of things. So different people in different parts of the country, uh, from different social classes, will read the ideas in these magazines and come over a slightly audience. But underlying that, there is still a set of gender codes that young women are, do, are proposed to follow. Now, a lot's changed since McRobbie or Winship were writing. Does it matter? Uh, by 94, Van Zunen, argued in feminist media studies, she made a number of critical points. Um, she looked at the danger of us of assuming that media and communication works in one direction, this kind of linear model that it comes out from the centre to the individual. And this idea that media is done to people, that the media changes in response to particular events. Valenzuni is also equally critical of approaches that use what we might term the uses and gratifications approaches. And instead, she advocates drawing upon a bit of post-structuralism that we can only think in terms of language and ideology. Uh, we need to go far deeper in our analysis, not just looking at the superficial ways in which these codes operate, but looking at the very language which is used to articulate these codes. <coughs> now, the feminist culture studies approach is still very, very influential. Um, cultural studies is an academic discipline in its own right and there's a various schools of cultural studies so there's feminist cultural studies, Marxist cultural studies, um, queer studies which looks at the ways in which uh, language articulates a particular heteronormativity that it's normal to be heterosexual and things like that and there's also a branch called post-colonial cultural studies which looks at issues <coughs> of race and ethnicity and how us that live in a post-colonial empire um, how these ideas still permeate through <coughs> so there's an idea of a gendered struggle through popular culture against hegemonic masculinities and this grew throughout the um, 2000s and today it's used widely in critique of contemporary media so c feminist culture studies is a very strong body of thought for critiquing cultural practice. <coughs> Excuse me, a bit of a cough today. Um, today it's widely used to critique contemporary media and also to understand various forms of resistance. Now, you might be familiar with this uh, hashtag here, the hashtag Me Too, which spread across Facebook and across various other forms of social media where women were telling the stories of uh, sexual abuse. This is a form of resistance. This is women utilising social media to re-articulate their position. So for feminist culture studies, this is very interesting. And I would think this would be a really good topic for a number of uh, masters, or sorry, uh, undergraduate dissertations next year. So do consider this as a way forward. Finally, to conclude today, where we've looked at two variants of feminist critique in the media, we've looked at liberal feminism, which sees the media as being... Um, Actually, we're not finishing it, so I'll come back on to some more bits in a minute. So we looked at uh, liberal feminism, which is the media as being at fault and highly contributory to the contemporary feminist situation. We also looked at uh, cultural studies feminism, which used some of the ideas from Gramsci, Marx and other theorists. So in this, the media play a part in maintaining a hegemonic system of gender relations. Now next week, we're going to look at a number of other feminist theories. We're going to be looking at radical feminism, post-structural feminism and the idea of uh, post-feminism. So I hope that is the end of the lecture. Um, sorry, I made a mistake a moment ago. But I, I hope you've enjoyed that and I hope it's been of some use to you. Thank you very much. <coughs>